first of all, um, you know, thank you, crew, for that uh, great introduction, and Chris for setting up this uh, opportunity to make this presentation uh, about the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Um, well, we're going to start our story several years before the St. Valentine's Day Massacre occurred, so it's a little easier to understand why it happened. A uh, logical place to start is with Big Jim Colosimo. You might have heard that name uh, in your uh, Chicago history. Colosimo was born in Italy, came to Chicago in 1891. It was still a frontier town then, uh, fertile territory for organized crime. Uh, Colosimo became active in, in the prostitution trade in 1902 and soon added gambling to his, his list of rackets. Uh, he most importantly ran a, a very successful restaurant. It, his, uh, his gang was, was multi-ethnic. There were Italians and Irish and others. And this became a really a, a trademark of, of organized crime in Chicago, unlike, say, in New York, where you know, the, the ethnicities were really divided among the different organized crime groups. Uh, in this picture, uh, you, just a, a quick note that the woman on the right uh, it, with, with Colosimo is, was his second wife, Dale Winter, who uh, became a, very, a, a fairly famous singer and actress. And after uh, a few years, she was on Broadway uh, for a while. So uh, she was the love of you know, Colosimo's life at that time. I want to introduce another individual, uh, uh, Johnny Torrio. Johnny Torrio was the chief lieutenant for, for Colosimo. Um, Torrio was from New York, but he came to Chicago in 1909, and he started working with Colosimo to develop the different rackets that they were involved in. Prohibition, you know, uh, it was mentioned earlier, it was enacted nationally in 1920. Uh, it created a, a lucrative opportunity for the mob. Um, Torrio immediately recognized this, and he wanted to move the Colosimo gang into bootlegging. Uh, but Colosimo was, was reluctant to do this. Uh, I show these, this picture on the right uh, mostly because I like cats. But <laughs> the idea here was just to reflect the fact that, you know, at the time of Prohibition, there was a great deal of support for, you know, for, for Prohibition. In other words, there were people all over the Midwest who wanted uh, to go dry. But at the same time, especially in cities like Chicago, there, was, there were many people who, who wanted to keep drinking. They wanted access to alcohol. Uh, they, that was part of their culture in many cases. And they, the idea of that not being a part of their lives anymore was really hard to fathom. So that's, thus you see the, this underground market developing with alcohol. And uh, who better to take advantage of this than organized crime groups? So as I mentioned, Torrio very much wanted to get involved in this, but Colosimo, he had his restaurant, he was part of society in Chicago, uh, along with his, his new wife, and he wasn't interested in, in seeing federal agents you know, at his doorstep. And so on May 11th, 1920, Colosimo was shot dead in his restaurant on Wabash Avenue. Uh, it's believed that uh, Torrio hired a hitman named Frankie Yale to kill Colosimo. This happened and Torrio quickly took over Colosimo's rackets. And as mentioned, he added bootlegging to the mix. Soon, uh, Torrio's gang was the biggest bootlegger in Chicago. Now we bring Al Capone into the story. Al Capone grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, he was involved in street gangs there. And it's possible, we don't know this for sure, but the, the conventional wisdom is that Torrio enticed Capone to move to Chicago. Um, Capone arrived in 1919. He started out as a bouncer at the Four Deuces Club, which was Torrio's headquarters. And later, uh, Capone kind of rose up the ladder and he became the manager. By 1924, he was really Torrio's number, number two man. And, uh, and, and, and he was involved in all the different aspects of the rackets they were doing, they were involved in. I, the picture on the left is where the Four Deuces uh, Club was. It was in what was called the Levee, which was a red light district just south of downtown. 
the, the four deuces had gambling, prostitution, and of course, drinking. Uh, the levee was a rough area, but it was close to higher end hotels and restaurants frequented by the middle and upper classes who occasionally would want to come down and, uh, and slum it a little bit and have fun. The picture on the right is the phone booth that was in the Four Deuces building. And it was de uh, the building was demolished in 1966. Uh, interestingly, the person who saved the phone booth was Chicago television personality, Bruce Newton, who uh, I'm sure some people on this call uh, will recognize that name. And uh, Newton uh, kept this phone booth in his house for more than 30 years. Well, after he passed away, uh, it was acquired by another individual who uh, ended up selling it to the Mob Museum. So it's resided in our museum since 2019. And it's just a great piece of memorabilia from the Four Deuces Club and, and from this that helps to tell this story about, you know, uh, Johnny Torrio, Al Capone, and, and the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Now, Torrio and Capone rapidly expanded their bootlegging business, uh, but they had a lot of competitors. This, this map kind of breaks down, this is from the Chicago Tribune in the 20s, and it breaks down kind of the territories within uh, the, Ch the Chicagoland as to who was in control of what areas. On the north side, you see you had uh, Dino Banyan uh, and the north side gang. Dino Banyan was this trigger happy bootlegger who also owned a flower shop. <laughs> uh, there was the Jenna family. These were Sicilians who were on the near west side. And they're famous, they famously made alcohol in small stills in the tenements of Little Italy. In other words, every apartment in that area, there would be a, a, a small still and the, each individual family would make alcohol for the Jennas. And uh, it was quite, quite an elaborate racket that they had going. On the near south side, you had uh, Frank McGurlin, who was a whole program in, its, in himself. He was quite a uh, character. Uh, Spike O'Donnell was also on the south side. Um, this was, um, uh, you can, as you can see, there were, there were gangs all throughout the area that were, were vying for uh, you know, for to make money and and wanting to expand their territory, and this led to what came came to be known as the beer wars, and you just started seeing a lot of violence in Chicago between uh, these rival bootlegging gangs, and these things this this uh, kind of violence extended well into the suburbs. It wasn't just in in the downtown or the south side. So Dean O'Banion, I mentioned Dean O'Banion. Um, he and uh, Torrio were probably the two biggest, biggest bootleggers in, uh, in Chicago at that time. They were uh, presumably in a truce. They presumably were, were working peacefully uh, together uh, to make sure uh, that, uh, you know, that violence did not get in the way of making money. However, uh, in O'Banion did something that was a little bit unforgivable to Torrio. He, he agreed to sell his share of a brewery to Torrio. Torrio paid him several hundred thousand dollars for the brewery, but O'Banion so, then uh, sold it to Torrio knowing full well there was going to be a police raid. In other words, he had been tipped off to the fact that they were gonna raid this brewery. And, and, and the raid happened and, and Torrio basically lost his investment. Uh, it was a setup that prompted Torrio to exact revenge. So on November 10th, 1924, uh, uh, Torrio gunman uh, shot O'Banion to death in his flower shop. Uh, three men entered the flower shop under the ruse that they were picking up flowers for a funeral. Uh, so uh, then they pulled out guns and, and shot O'Banion dead. So this was the really you're, we're in 1924, so we're still four or five years away from the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, but this is where we start seeing uh, the, the rivalries start to accelerate. There's going to be retaliation, of course. So uh, on January 24th, 1925, O'Banion's partners, Jaime Weiss and George Bugs Moran, retaliate by shooting Torrio in the street. He's literally on the sidewalk with his wife 
Santorio was shot. He was hit with five bullets. Um, amazingly, Torrio survived. Uh, but Torrio was pretty shaken up by this. And uh, he, in March of 1925, he turns over operations of the, what's becoming known as the Chicago outfit uh, to Al Capone. Al Capone was his number two, but he was only 26 years old at the time. That's something these people easily forget. Capone is suddenly put in charge of this big, you know, organized crime uh, operation when he's 26 years old. The retaliation, of course, is going to continue. It's now that you know the hit on Torrio prompts uh, uh, the unsuccessful hit on Torrio. Uh, the they want to now Capone's in charge, and the North Side Gang wants to wants to deal with Capone. Um, Capone had been trying uh, in the year 1926 to get rid of Jaime Weiss. Jaime Weiss had taken control of the North Side Gang after uh, Bugs uh, after uh, Dino Banyan was killed. But there are two attempts on Weiss that fail. So uh, on, on September 20th, 1926, there's an attempt on Capone's life in the restaurant of the Hawthorne Hotel in Cicero. There's massive Tommy gun assault. This has been depicted in, in movies, uh, but uh, 10 different vehicles drove by this restaurant and fired more than 1,000 rounds um, amazingly, no one died. Uh, I mean, a thousand rounds and no one died. Four bystanders were injured, uh, but Capone uh, was not injured. And uh, it was sort of an amazing uh, display of firepower, first of all. Uh, and then it's, uh, you know, amazing that, that no one was killed. So naturally, Capone is looking for revenge on his side. Uh, the third time was the charm uh, when it came to taking out Jaime Weiss. On October 20, October 11th, 1926, uh, Capone's men had come up with a, a sort of a surefire way to finally get Weiss. That they set up uh, basically a machine gun nest in a second floor apartment window. And when Weiss parks his car near the O'Banion flower shop, uh, bullets rain down from the second floor apartment window. Uh, Weiss was hit 10 times and he was killed. Now, by this time, uh, Capone was, was becoming well known in Chicago and he, the press came and asked him, hey, did you kill Jaime Weiss? And uh, Capone was like, he said, exactly. I'm sorry Weiss was killed, but I didn't have anything to do with it. Of course, what else would he say, right? But on October 20th, 1926, so just 10 days later, a peace conference is held uh, and with the idea that, you know, the, the shooting that's going on back and forth between these two uh, bootlegging gangs is going to be come to an end. Capone tells the press, I believe it's peace to stay. I know I won't break it, and I don't think they will. I feel like a kid, I'm so happy, Capone said. All should have been going well for Capone at this point, but he still had enemies. A man named Joseph Aiello was one of them who tried to poison Capone in a restaurant. Didn't work. Aiello's repeated attempts to kill Capone backfired uh, because Capone then put one of his men, Jack McGurn, uh, to, to, he went after Aiello's men, killed many of them. Uh, and in the end, Aiello fled Chicago and moved to New Jersey. So Capone, you know, he's seeing all this and he is at least publicly saying that he's really, he's really tired of the violence. He's really tired of, of the harassment from the police. He's tired of have to pay off all these politicians all the time so he can do his job. And he starts thinking about retiring from crime and relocating to Florida. Capone says that his son was being teased at school uh, because of all the publicity about his father. Uh, Capone is quoted as saying, let the worthy citizens of Chicago get their liquor the best they can. I'm sick of the job. It's a thankless one and full of grief. I don't know when I'll be back, if ever. <laughs> so Al visited Miami. He took a liking to it. There was plenty of gambling action. You know, Capone loved to gamble. Uh, this is before Las Vegas was a big thing, or I'm sure he would have been here. 
uh, plenty of gambling action at the casinos and the racetracks in Florida. This was a place where he could enjoy the fruits of all his illegal hard work. Uh, he also, and there was a personal element to it, he needed a way to separate his mother and his wife. His mother and his wife did not get along that, all that well, and they lived in the same house in Chicago. Uh, so Capone, uh, again, always talking to the press, he told reporters that Miami is, quote, the garden of America, the sunny Italy of the new world, where life is good and abundant, where happiness is to be had even by the poorest. Quite a uh, sales job for Miami. Well, in March of 1928, Capone bought a mansion on Palm Island in Biscayne Bay, that's this house pictured here, uh, for $40,000. Of course, it's worth, you know, over a million, well over a million dollars or several million today. Uh, but he spent uh, more than $100,000 on improvements, uh, including a large swimming pool, which there are pictures, if you want to see his swimming pool, it was pretty impressive, and it, it, you can see pictures of that online. Um, and his, his uh, wife, May, and his, his son, Sonny, would stay in Florida year-round while his mother remained in Chicago. So let's switch uh, gears and talk about Bugs Moran. Now, George Bugs Moran took over the Northside gang following Jaime Weiss's murder. It continued to be a problem for Capone. Uh, you remember Moran had been involved in this, he'd been involved for many years in this back and forth between the two gangs. Um, it's I, Capone and, and his followers decide, you know, it's time uh, to get Bugs Moran. We need to take this guy out of the way so that we can expand our bootlegging empire. So in the fall of 1928, Capone gathers his closest associates at a lodge in, in Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin. And they put together a plan to kill Moran. So this picture shows where the St. Valentine's Day massacre occurred. This is 2122 North Clark Street. Uh, it was a garage, it was about 25 feet wide, about 150 feet deep. Uh, one of Moran's men, uh, Adam Heyer, had leased, leased the building. It says SMC Cartage Company, and uh, there's a shipping and packing company, but that's not really what it was. Uh, Get Moran, uh, used, the gang used the building for liquor storage and maintenance of their trucks. There was a man named John May who regularly worked there repairing the gang's trucks, shipping liquor all over you know, uh, Illinois. We're getting in now to the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. I want everybody to know that you know, these pictures coming up, maybe you've seen them before, maybe not. They're a little bit graphic just to show, you know, the, what happened, but I just want to definitely forewarn you of what, what you're seeing. So a lot of planning went into the hit, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. At the beginning of February, uh, they, uh, Capone's people rented these street facing rooms opposite uh, this garage at 2119 and 2135 North Clark Street. These were gonna be lookout locations. They were gonna start looking for when Bugs Moran was arriving at this building so that they could take him out. On the morning of February 14th, 1929, Moran had called a meeting at the North Clark Street garage. Uh, contrary to popular mythology, they were not there to receive a hijacked boat of whiskey. We hear about that occasionally, but that's not why they were there when you you look at the individuals, they were dressed very nicely. Uh, they were there, you know, perhaps later on that Valentine's Day, they were taking somebody out or what have you. They were not ready to start unloading a truck or anything like that. The meeting was called for other reasons, not clear uh, what those reasons are, but they were not receiving a, a hijacked load of whiskey. So on the morning of February 14th, John May, uh, Al Kachelik, Adam Heyer, Frank Gusenberg, Pete Gusenberg, and Reinhard Schwimmer arrive at the garage. Then another one of their gang members, Albert Weinshank, shows up, and he looks a lot like Bugs Moran from a distance. So the lookouts are in these apartments, and they mistake Weinshank for Moran, and they make a call. You know, hey guys, it's time. So before long, a Cadillac-branded police vehicle pulls up in front of the garage. Four men two wearing police uniforms, 
get out and enter the garage. The shooting commences. Afterward, the men come out, uh, the four men come out and the Cadillac drives away. Well, neighbors hear some popping noises, like sounds like gunfire, could be firecrackers, could be a backfire of a car, not sure. They also hear a howling dog inside this garage. A neighbor enters the garage and comes upon this horrific scene. There are six men dead and one who is barely hanging on. The neighbor talks briefly to the one survivor, Frank Gusenberg, then, leave, then he runs out to call the police and the ambulance. The police arrive around 10.45 a.m. Frank Gusenberg, that's the guy who was surviving, is taken to the hospital. He won't say anything to anybody about the assailants. He just is mom, like mobsters would be. He ends up dying at 1.30 p.m. that day. So the police uniforms and the police car used by the hitmen cause a lot of confusion. Uh, you know, victims think that the police you know, are telling you these police officers went in there and shot these guys dead. But this confusion was, was the worst, of course, for the shooting victims. When they saw the uniform clad men enter the garage, and obviously they let their guard down. You know, these, some of these guys who were in the garage were hardened you know, gangsters. They were not gonna let themselves be lined up against a wall uh, as, as is what happened here and, and fired upon. But they thought they were police officers and this was just gonna be another police shakedown. They certainly, they did not expect to just be shot dead. So I mentioned about uh, the, the lookouts thinking that Bugs Moran had arrived at the garage. Well, it wasn't Moran. He was late for this meeting. He was getting a haircut and it ran long. Uh, so he, when he's walking up the road, he sees these two officers and these two other men walk into the garage. And he, he's like, oh man, I don't want anything to do with that. So he takes off. Afterward, when Moran learned about what had happened, he was suffered from tremendous shock. You know, He checks himself into a hospital in Evanston later that day. He is there for a few days. Then he takes off for Detroit. Then he goes to Windsor, Ontario, then to Montreal. Then he actually goes to Paris. Clearly, you know, Moran knew he was a target and he stayed away from Chicago for several months. So this is just a different view. And if you're looking at the massacre scene from the other direction, you see a man uh, slumped over a chair on the far side. That's Peter Gusenberg. And in the previous slide, you did not see him, but in this slide you do. So I just wanted to share that. This is a large crowd that gathered outside the garage. You know, this was a big deal and uh, people in the neighborhood all wanted to find out what was happening. Not unlike, uh, you know, people looking at a car accident today or whatever we do that draws, a, draws people's attention. This, uh, this is a large crowd watching a body being removed from the crime scene. Uh, this I believe is the back of the garage. Um, and, you know, it's obviously this solemn work that is happening. They're taking these bodies out, but people are crowded around. They want to see. And this is a sketch that helps to orient where the shooting occurred inside the building. You can see that the men were lined up uh, on, the, on the right side there. And then the uh, four men, two pulled out Tommy guns, Thompson submachine guns, and two had uh, 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 shotguns. You can see that there was there were trucks in, parked inside the building, and uh, the dog was chained to one of those trucks. This is a, a kind of a really strange thing. I think it was strange, but the the Cook County Coroner Herman uh, Bundesen decided in, in the investigation that what they needed to do was reenact the massacre and. So everybody would understand exactly what transpired, I guess. And there were many photos taken of this uh, reenactment. That's what you see here. These are a, a variety of businessmen and police officers and different in, uh, you know, leaders of, of Chicago who were all brought together uh, to reenact the massacre. So that's, that's what we're looking at with this picture. It's not the actual massacre, not a movie. It actually was a reenactment. 
Let's talk about the victims. So six massacre victims died at the scene uh, these, as these pictures uh, have revealed. One, Frank Gusenberg was still breathing. He was taken to a nearby hospital and he died several hours later. Uh, as we mentioned, you know, he wouldn't tell the police anything about what happened. So Peter and Frank Gusenberg, these were brothers and they were top enforcers for the North Side Gang. Uh, Al Weinshank was an official of the Central Cleaners and Dyers Association, clothes cleaning, and he was also a nightclub operator. Albert Kachelik was Moran's number two man. He was an enforcer uh, and he's often on, was known as James Clark. So if you look at a list, sometimes you'll see him mentioned as James Clark, but his actual name was Albert Kachelik. Adam Heyer was a bookkeeper and a business manager for the gang. He was part owner of a dog track with Moran. John May uh, was a mechanic for the gang. His, his main responsibility was to keep the trucks running. He also was a father of seven. People had big families back in those days. The person who's not pictured is Reinhard Schwimmer. Uh, and what's really interesting about Schwimmer is he was not a gangster. Uh, he was an optician. He made glasses for people, including members of uh, Moran's gang. But he also was like a kind of like a gangster groupie. He he loved hanging around these guys. He thought it was, you know, it was cool to hang around with these gangsters. And ultimately, you know, he paid the he paid the price. But that was um, that, that this was the group that uh, lost their lives on that day. Now, again, Capone was on Miami at the time of the massacre. On that morning, he was meeting with local authorities to assure them he was a good guy. So, and two days after the massacre, he held a big party at his mansion. 80 people were there. A reporter asked him about the murder. Quote, that fellow Moran isn't called bugs for nothing. He's crazy if he thinks I had anything to do with that killing. I, get, I think before that, Bugs had suggested that uh, Capone was responsible. But the massacre was a turning point in the public's attitude toward the mob. Before this event, Capone was, was especially, Capone especially was seen by some as kind of a Robin Hood figure in Chicago. He had a lot of friends among the common people because he handed out a lot of money. He had a lot of allies in the quarters of power because he paid a lot of money to police officers and to politicians and to judges. But the massacre, you know, for the public was a step too far. People suddenly reached the conclusion that the violence associated with the mob and prohibition was really no longer acceptable. They finally crossed the line that people were not comfortable with. And one person who was super uncomfortable with it was President Herbert, Herbert Hoover. And, and Hoover famously told his uh, federal law enforcement agencies that they needed to figure out a way to get Capone, to put Capone behind bars. This eventually happened, as I'm sure you all know, but we'll get to that in a minute. Before that happened, the heat had really turned up on the mob. And so a, a peace conference or a conference was a mob conference was held in Atlantic City in May of 1929. And it was none other than Johnny Torrio who put this together. And Al Capone was invited. This is a picture uh, that uh, much uh, distributed picture of Capone uh, in Atlantic City in May of 1929, along with other various mobsters. The guy right behind him on the right is uh, Nucky Johnson, who was the, the mob boss in Atlantic City. They made, uh, you know, uh, uh, HBO made a series about his life that was inspired by his life. The idea was, the, the fear was that Capone's enemies were out for blood. So he was advised at this conference that he needed to go somewhere safe for a while until, you know, everything cooled down. And the solution these guys came up with was prison. <laughs> On May 16, 1929, Capone and his bodyguard, Frankie Rio, they left Atlantic City by car, had car trouble, and missed their train connection in Philadelphia. Whether this was on purpose or accidental is not, I can't say for sure, but the impression is that this was all orchestrated. So they were, went to a movie theater in Philadelphia. When they came out, they were arrested by two detectives who were there, and they were carrying concealed firearms. That's what this uh, report, uh, police report shows. 
The following day, Capone and, and Frankie Rio plead guilty to the gun charges. And the impression we have is that they probably expected to get maybe 60 or 90 days in prison for this with good time, you know, if they, with good behavior, maybe they'd get out sooner. But the judge apparently wasn't in on the in, in on the scheme because he sentenced them to the full sentence, which was one year in prison. Capone was not too happy about getting the maximum sentence. Uh, so in any case, now Capone is in prison in Philadelphia. So we'll leave him there for the moment. So who, who actually committed the St. Valentine's Day Massacre? Now, who are these men? Uh, uh, they were a, for, a group of former Egan's Rats gang members from St. Louis. So the, they were hired by Capone because they would not be recognized by Moran's people. Moran was on the outlook. Keep in mind, all these shootings have gone back and forth. Everybody's on edge. They're always looking over their shoulder. Is somebody you know, aiming a gun at me? Uh, and they had gu uh, guards around them at all times. So it wasn't easy you know, to get it wasn't as easy as it might seem to just knock somebody off, especially like Bugs Moran. So what you need to do is bring in people who were uh, not as well known, whose faces would not be recognized. Capone called these, these guys the American, his American boys. They were not Italian mostly, and they were, uh, they were unknown largely in Chicago. These are two of them in the picture. There's Gus Winkler on the left, uh, and it's uh, Fred Burke on the right. Uh, these were two of the individuals. Another man was Ray uh, Nugent, Bob Carey, and Fred Getz. And we believe the lookouts in the apartments there were Byron Bolton and Jimmy Moran. And it was Fred Burke and it was Fred Getz who are believed to have worn the, the police uniforms who committed the, uh, committed the massacre. Now let's dig a little deeper into Fred Killer Burke. That was his nickname. So uh, Burke, after the massacre, he hides out in St. Joseph, Michigan, which is in Southwest Michigan. You guys probably know that. On, uh, but on uh, December 14th, 1929, uh, he is in a car accident. He gets in a car accident. It's a minor accident, but the motorists are, are upset at each other. And Officer Charles Skelly uh, intervenes in the dispute. You know, at the time, Fred Burke was believed to have been highly inebriated, and he, instead of trying to just resolve this peacefully, he ends up shooting the officer, Skelly, three times. Uh, uh, Burke escapes, uh, and he is now on the run, not for killing a police officer. So Burke is on the run. The, you know, the investigators go to his house just outside of St. Joseph. And when they get there, they find a cache of weapons. And you can see from this picture, there are Tommy guns there. There are other guns as well. Uh, it's quite a, it's got, you know, all kinds of, all kinds of different uh, hardware. And this is where we start to discover that uh, exactly what was, ha what happened at the St. Valentine's Day massacre. Cook County Coroner Herman Bundesen, I mentioned who, who set up the reenactment, he recruited Calvin Goddard out of New York to study the crime scene ballistic evidence. Goddard uh, was one of the early, uh, uh, he was one of the pioneers of ballistic testing. He con soon concluded that the two Tommy guns and two shotguns, that he first he concluded that two Tommy guns and two shotguns were used in the massacre. And because police, the police uniforms on, they tested all the weapons that the police department had and none of them matched. But when these Tommy guns were recovered from Fred Burke's house in Michigan, he got her tested those and he definitively linked those Tommy guns to the massacre, the ballistic evidence. And uh, this was a clear sign that certainly Fred Burke was involved and we later would learn about some of his accomplices. So in March of 1931, now we're talking two years now after the massacre, Burke was captured in Green City, Missouri. A local citizen, you know, he's, Burke was living under a different name. He was living a very peaceful life, but a local citizen who loved to read about crime, he would get all these magazines and so forth, and there were wanted posters for Fred Burke. He recognized Burke 
and he called the authorities. At first, they didn't believe him. And it took him a long time to convince somebody to come and pick him up. But ultimately, Burke was arrested in Green City. Um, he was sent back to Michigan. And that's the home on the right is the home he was living in in Missouri when he was caught. Um, he was sent back to Michigan and uh, he was uh, sent to prison for the murder of the Michigan police officer. Uh, as a result of Burke's conviction in Michigan and the deaths of some of the other suspects in the case, no one was ever prosecuted for the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Bob Carey, I mentioned his name, he was shot to death in 1932 in New York. Ray Nugent, he vanished in Florida, just disappeared off the face of the earth. Gus Winkler was shot to death in, in 1933 in Chicago. Fred Getz was shot to death that same year in Chicago. Um, Byron Bolton, I mentioned he was one of the lookouts. He was taken into custody in 1935, and he revealed many details about the massacre to the FBI. I don't think it was a coincidence that so many of these individuals died in the years after, after the massacre. You know, the Chicago outfit really did not want any more information than absolutely necessary to come out about who was responsible. So this is a little side uh, bar. The, the, the Clark Street building was torn down in 1967, the building where the massacre occurred. An entrepreneur named George Patey recognized the historical value of the bricks in the wall where these men were lined up. And he went and before, and when they were tearing down the building, he acquired those bricks. Now Patey, he, he numbered and lettered all the bricks so that the wall could be recreated exactly as it was. He had acquired, I think, more than 400 bricks at that time. And they were all, as I said, lettered and numbered. And then he recreated the wall in a couple of different places. He had them set up in a nightclub one time. He had it in another establishment. And they were, you know, sort of a, a talking piece at his different establishments. But he never really hit a home run with this. Um, later, uh, the bricks were, after he died, his niece uh, acquired the bricks. His niece happened to live in Las Vegas. And when the talk about the mob museum started to bubble up in the press here in Las Vegas, that it was, the mob museum was coming, she contacted the museum board members and said, hey, I've got these bricks. We investigated, ultimately concluded they were authentic, and we acquired them in 2009. And we've had them on display at the museum ever since. And this is a picture of what they look like. Uh, the, the red marking on there is something Patey put on there to kind of uh, show where some of the pock marks are and the bullets were missing, where, where uh, to make it look like blood, but it's not blood. But otherwise, these are the authentic bricks from the Clark Street, Clark Street building. This is another my museum uh, piece. So I, I mentioned the ballistic evidence from the massacre crime scene. It never went to the Chicago Police Department's evidence vault. One of the reasons was the police, as, you, as we mentioned, they were suspected of the crime. So it was, the, it was the Cook County coroner who acquired the evidence, the ballistic evidence, and then he turned it over to Calvin Goddard, who kept it at his crime lab for several years. Well, when Goddard left Chicago, he turned over the, all of this evidence to his assistant. And when his assistant was uh, offered the job to start a crime lab in Madison, Wisconsin, he took this evidence with him. So when he died 20 years later, his brother, who was also a ballistics expert, took inherited this crime scene evidence. He had it for 20 years. Then when he died, his daughter inherited it. His daughter had it for a number of years, and then she ended up selling it to a collector who lived in Monroe, Wisconsin, still does. So the collector had it for a few years, and he decided that he went, uh, we thought it'd be best that this material was in a museum. So we made a deal with him in 2015, and we acquired the ballistic evidence from the Valentine, St. Valentine's Day Massacre. What you see here are bullets on these little boxes. That, these are bullets that were removed from the bodies of the victims. Pretty, it's kind of gruesome on one hand, but it's also fascinating on another. And we have the uh, coroner's report showing exactly where these individuals were shot. We have a lot of other material too that's not on display, but just having this evidence is a very rare thing because normally, you know, this is kept in a vault, an evidence vault somewhere, never to be seen by the public. So 
So where where are the Tommy guns that were used in the massacre? The ones that uh, were that were recovered from Fred Burke's home in Berrien County, Michigan. Well, those guns remain in Berrien County. The sheriff's department has them. Uh, they have been on temporary display several times at the Mob Museum, including 10 days ago on our anniversary. Our, we always celebrate our anniversary at the museum on February 14th. Uh, and on that day, we had the, the Tommy guns. They brought them out from Michigan and had them on display. We've done this several times and people really like to see them up close. Someday, perhaps, those guns will be on permanent display at the Mob Museum, but, but not just yet. So, a little bit, uh, a couple of slides where we talk about what happened to different people. So what happened to Al Capone? He uh, went to prison in Philadelphia, as we discussed. Uh, he was released from prison on March 17th, 1930. He had served 10 months. He got two months off for good behavior. For some reason, Capone was always a, a really nice guy in prison, even if he was a horrific killer outside of prison. Uh, but his troubles were not over, not by a long shot. Uh, because remember Her Herbert Hoover said we need to get Capone? Well, in the meantime, uh, federal agents were investigating Capone on two fronts. One, they were looking at bootlegging charges, uh, prohibition violations, and the other, they were looking at a tax evasion case. Ultimately, they decided to prosecute him for tax evasion, and he was convicted in October of 1931. Again, they threw the book at him. The judge sentenced him to 11 years in prison. He served part of that sentence in the island prison of Alcatraz, which is interesting because Alcatraz was a super high security prison, the most uh, you know, unimpeachable prison in the federal system. Uh, but in the end, Capone was sent there for tax evasion for a white collar crime, essentially kind of interesting. Uh, ultimately, Capone was released in 1939 after serving seven and a half years. Again, some good time credits there. But Capone by that time was, was ill, both physically and mentally. He retired from uh, organized crime and lived out his life at his home in Miami Beach. He died in 1947 uh, when he was 48 years old. He died essentially of natural causes. What happened to Johnny Torrio? Uh, Torrio continued to be involved in organized crime, mostly in, in New York. Um, he uh, ultimately died of a heart attack in 1957 in Brooklyn. He was 75 years old. So not all mobsters get gunned down in the street. Some live to a ripe old age. What happened to Bugs Moran? Well, after the massacre, as we mentioned, Moran hid out for a while, even as far away as Paris. But his Northside gang continued to operate after the massacre. This is another a little mythology, something uh, people think that Basically, the massacre ended the Northside Gang. That's not really true. The Northside Gang had more members and they continued to operate, although eventually they did disappear. Uh, Moran spent a lot of his time in his hometown of St. Paul, Minnesota, arranging various deals. He also started moving his bootlegging activities to Lake County, just a little ways away from all of you, and to Southern Wisconsin. Uh, Moran also got involved with slot machines in Lake County in the early 1930s. And later in the 1940s, he moved to Kentucky and he, he put together this uh, bank robbing gang. Um, this was not the, the brightest idea. Uh, and ultimately in 1946, he was found guilty of robbing a tavern in Dayton, Ohio. And he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. On February 25th, 1957, Moran died in Leavenworth prison. He died of lung cancer. Uh, he was 63 years old. So this is where some of these individuals who were involved in the massacre in one way or another, this is how they ended up. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up with just mentioning a couple of things. Um, the, the Mom Museum has a lot of resources available uh, for students, for teachers, and for just anybody who's interested in knowing more about organized crime. One of the things that's not on this screen here is we have a website about the same, like a sub, a web, part of our website has a whole uh, uh, much more detailed description of the St. Valentine's Day massacre with pictures and a lot of details, not all of which we are able to get to tonight. So if you want to learn more about that, you can do it by looking at our, at our website. That's one way. But if you're a teacher or you have other kind of interests in sharing 
we have a lot of material here that's available about the mob on our website and, and a lot of ways to, to use this kind of material in the classroom. Not so much necessarily about the mob for younger students, but we have a lot of historical things, a lot of things about pro, you know, the, the amendments, the prohibition amendments and different things that are really useful in, in class. And then for those who really wanna dig deeper, this slide provides a list of good books to deal with the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Uh, John Binder lives uh, not too far. He lives in Chicago. A really great resource on the, anything related to the Chicago mob. Uh, the Scarface and the Untouchable, that's going to be a TV series, I think, coming soon. But uh, Brad Schwartz and Max Allen Collins did a tremendous job there talking mo a lot about Al Capone, but also a lot about Elliot Ness and what he was all about, separating fact from fiction in regard to him. Uh, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, The Untold Story uh, by uh, William J. Helmer, the late William J. Helmer and Arthur Bilek. Excellent uh, detailed look at uh, the massacre itself. Um, and also this book, Al Capone and His American Boys. Uh, this is um, a really interesting book because it's based largely on a memoir written by Gus Winkler's wife. And Gus Winkler's wife was a great resource for historians wanting to learn more about what really happened with the planning and execution of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. The Man Who Got Away is a book about Bugs Moran. And you know, often he, is, he was the target of the massacre. He survived the massacre. He was a major mobster in Chicago. And yet he was always overshadowed by Al Capone. You know, people are fascinated by Al Capone and they could barely, they barely know who Bugs Moran is. Well, Rose Keefe does a great job of, of explaining the Bugs Moran stories. That's highly recommended. And finally, last but certainly not least, a Killing in Capone's Playground. This is the story of Fred Burke. And this is the story of the, that happened in Michigan with the shooting of the police officer. Uh, Burke goes on the lam, uh, the recovery of the Tommy guns and all of that. And Chris Lyon uh, has done a tremendous job of outlining uh, that part of this story. So if you wanna know more about what I've spoken about tonight, these are, these are the books to, to consult, for sure.